David Biddix. Uh, I'm currently the director of marketing at Western Piedmont Community College in Morganton, but uh, this is kind of my hobby and my passion is local history. Uh, Chris in the back and I, about what, 10 years ago, gosh, it's been more than that, 11 years ago now, we started with the, uh, an Arcadia book on Spruce Pine, and we've just kind of been doing this, that, and the other through the years and, and uncovering neat stories. And tonight we have a story to tell you that I think will surprise some of you. I think uh, it will intrigue you and hopefully make you a little more interested in learning more about our area in the Civil War because it is very, very different than we kind of thought, which we hope to get into tonight. But that's a little bit about me. You want to say anything? You want me to? Okay, my daughter Amanda's down here. She's kind of our researcher. We call her our, our mole down at the North Carolina Collection. She's at school at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, majoring in history and archaeology, but she's done a lot of the pulling of the stuff for us over the months that we've been working on this. And Jonathan, why don't you do yourself a little favor here and introduce? Yeah, um, well, good evening. My name is uh, Ranger Jonathan Bennett. I'm a National Park Ranger on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I'm stationed um, um, at the Minerals Museum over here. My district runs from uh, Mount Mitchell to Grandfather Mountain. Um, okay. Yeah, they, they want to use my. Okay. So, um, uh, so my district runs from. Uh, well, uh, I'll just start from the beginning. My name is uh, Ranger Jonathan Bennett. I'm a National Park Ranger on the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, stationed at the Minerals Museum over here. But my district runs from Mount Mitchell to Grandfather Mountain. Um, I'm uh, I've been working on the parkway since uh, 2003. Uh, so uh, my primary job is to do uh, history and interpretation on the parkway. So we do, we've done a lot of different history programs over the years. Um, I uh, grew up in Yancey County, uh, but I was actually born in Spruce Pine Hospital over here. Uh, I went to uh, Wake Forest where I double majored in history and archaeology. And um, uh, whenever, um, besides uh, working on the parkway, I also worked with David on uh, writing a book on uh, Mount Mitchell for Arcadia Publishing. All right, is that better? Can everybody hear us now a little bit better? But okay? All right, we want to talk to you tonight, and this is a little bit light for the moment. It's, it will get better as it gets darker, I promise. But we're, we're entitling our presentation tonight the red and white strings, and we're going to explain what that is in a little bit. But we're going to be telling you about a fellow who owned this about 150, 160 years ago, Isaac English. And we're going to tell you about his role in the Civil War. In particular, he assisted, at least that we know of, four Union um, officers to get back to the Union lines in Tennessee and, and go back to fighting in the Civil War in 1864. The first thing I'll tell you about that is the, the events we're going to talk about tonight did not occur where you're at. Okay, he owned the inn, and it was here, but he had a house up in, it's just across the Mitchell-Avery County line near the Toe River. Uh, it's in what's called the Yellow Mountain area up there. Uh, and that's where uh, most of this happens, okay, that we're going to be talking about. But Isaac was all over here, um, born in, I believe, 18, Chris, help me here, 1835? Does that sound right? I know he died in 1910, and we're going to kind of, you know, get you to the end. But he's born in the 1820s, 1830s. In fact, all of these guys that we're going to talk about tonight were born in that time frame. Okay, so they were young men when this is going on. Uh, and he was, uh, I won't say notorious, but I guess we could say he was known as a union sympathizer. Okay? Um, in the past, there has been a lot of discussion that Mitchell County was formed in 1861 as a direct result of the Union-Confederate split. Okay, we're going to tell you tonight, uh, up front, that is not the case. That is not what happened. In fact, they were working on forming the county for 10 years before the Civil War. So, number one, that didn't happen. Number two, we're going to tell you about a Mitchell County that does not fit what I just told you, because it was very much a split sympathy county. Lots of rebels here, and Union supporters also. We're going to tell you a little bit about that tonight, more than we've ever known before. Okay? So with that said, let's get started a little bit this evening. 
if I can get this to come up. This is a picture, and this was probably hard to see. I'll put this back up at the end of the presentation. But that is, in fact, if you were looking where this is sitting, that was this end around the 1870s. Somewhere in that neighborhood is what we're guessing. Uh, we will also tell you that there's a good chance Isaac English is in this picture. We don't know which one he is, though. He would have been older at that time. Jonathan and I have a guess. And again, I'll put this back up when it gets darker so you can see it better. But that is probably, and Chris, correct me here, that's probably the oldest picture ever we've got. Okay? Uh, and the story behind this picture is very interesting. When we finished the Spruce Vine book in 2008, we were getting ready to ship it off to the printer, and Michael Hardy, who's over here, contacted us and says, I've got a photo. And he's like, and we're like, well, the book's done. <laughs> and he's like, no, you want this photo. And this is what he shows up with. Now, it was in the trash, and a lady found it. Florence Berryhill here in town. Is that right, Michael? Yeah. And got it to him, and that's how we ended up with it in the book. And, and we can share it with you tonight. So, again, I'm hoping when it gets a little darker, we'll come back to it so you can see it. With any of this, if you want to see them later, please let me know. We'll bring them back. Okay? So with that said, I think it's Jonathan's turn now to talk a little bit because we want to tell you about these four fellas that came through here in 1864. This would have been in December 1864, somewhere in that neighborhood when they got here. So Jonathan, why don't you introduce our four officers? Close to your mouth. Yeah. Um, well, um, the four uh, Union officers that we're going to be talking about tonight are these four men. Um, they would uh, uh, be captured and uh, escape from uh, a, a Confederate prison in South Carolina, which we'll talk to a little bit more in a second. But just to give you an idea of who they are, um, there's uh, four of them. Starting on the left is uh, Captain Andrew Benson. He started out in the uh, uh, 1st Maine Cavalry, and so he is from the state of Maine. Um, by, but whenever he uh, gets captured in 1864, he's transferred to the uh, first uh, cavalry of the District of Columbia. Um, the um, second man uh, in the picture with the uh, go team, uh, that is uh, James Monroe uh, Gear. He's the one uh, that's going to be really important uh, with Isaac English whenever they come back. But uh, he was a member of the 122nd New York uh, Volunteer Infantry. Um, and. Um, he was also another man in his unit was uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Horace uh, Hall Walpole. Uh, we've got it A up there, but we eventually found his actual uh, full middle name. It's Hall, not uh, Hall. Uh, but um, we uh, don't have a picture of Walpole that we uh, can uh, positively identify yet, but uh, we think we do have him in a couple of group shots. We just haven't figured out which one he is. Uh, then. Um, uh, finally, you've got uh, Lieutenant uh, Henry Carell, who was in the uh, uh, Company K of the 2nd uh, uh, Vermont Volunteer Infantry. Um, Carell, uh, before the war, um, he actually had a family in Vermont, and uh, uh, one of his uh, sons was nine years old, and he went out uh, ice skating in uh, one of the rivers near his home, and he broke through the ice, was under the water for about 15 minutes, and died. Uh, so. Um, uh, he had a little bit of tragedy before the war ever broke out. But uh, probably the most noteworthy thing that any of them did before the war uh, actually started uh, was uh, Horace Walpole. Uh, he actually is uh, a professional baseball player, believe it or not. Um, uh, he uh, belonged to the uh, Syracuse Baseball Club uh, uh, before the war. So uh, kind of interesting that you'd actually have a baseball player like that. Amongst them. Let me tell you one thing. One thing I wanted to kind of tell you about, you know, you hear all the bad stuff about the internet. This is an example of where the internet helps, okay? This is, I'll call it hidden in plain sight. Everything we're telling you tonight, we found online. And it's been there 130 years, okay? The account we're going to talk about tonight was written in the 1890s. But we didn't know about it until last year. So this gives you an idea. I mean, everything he just pulled out and told you there, we found online. So that's how we can tell you about these guys. I just wanted to share that before we move on. That's how we get the information we're sharing. Okay. Um, uh, 
all of the four men we're talking about get captured in the year 1864. And um, three of them get captured um, in uh, the beginning of May of 1864 at the Battle of the Wilderness. Now, um, the Battle of the Wilderness um, is uh, part of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's Overland campaign. It's actually the first battle in that. And um, the idea was um, uh, that they were going to um, bring U.S. Grant from out west after he'd had success at Vicksburg and more importantly had rescued the Union Army at Chattanooga. And um, they were going to put him in charge of uh, the army and see if he could do any better with Lee than the other Union generals were doing. And so um, he um, started off uh, marching t uh, towards Richmond, got to the Rappahannock River, which is where the uh, old battleground for uh, Chancellorsville was. That's where uh, uh, Stonewall Jackson gets uh, uh, shot and mortally wounded the year before. Um, well, the uh, Battle of the Wilderness uh, turns out to be a pretty big fiasco. It's uh, You're fighting in a bunch of scrub brush. Um, uh, the Confederates inflict heavy, heavy losses on them. And in fact, um, the valley has a pretty close connection to this battle itself. Uh, one of the units from here, the 16th North Carolina um, uh, Infantry, um, actually uh, took part in that battle. And um, several of the men from uh, the valley actually uh, uh, were either wounded or killed in the battle. Well, one of them was uh, my great great uncle, uh, William Albert Fox. His war ended at the Battle of the Wilderness when he got shot in the wrist there. But um, the uh, the Battle of the Wilderness was pretty confused where they're out here fighting in all this, uh, uh, all the trees and the scrub brush. Uh, it's got adds a, um, another element of horror whenever you had some uh, brush fires break out, and so some of the men that were actually wounded were too wounded to get out of the way of the forest fires coming through, and so they perished in the flames. So amongst all of this confusion, um, the uh, uh, 122nd uh, New York uh, needed to try to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, put its line out. And so um, Horace Walpole, which was one of the leading officers of the unit, went out to try to find all the men and accidentally uh, stumbled into Confederate lines and was taken uh, prisoner. Um, uh, James Gear was with him, and so he was also taken prisoner at that same time. Uh, a little later on in the day, uh, the second uh, Vermont uh, was uh, uh, also involved in some of that stuff, and so uh, uh, Henry Correll uh, ends up getting captured that day as well. Now. <coughs> Um, Andrew, uh, Captain Andrew Benson, who was with the um, uh, First District of Columbia Cavalry, uh, he actually doesn't get captured at the Battle of the Wilderness. He uh, um, is able to fight through most of the major battles of the Overland Campaign, the Battle of the Wilderness, uh, uh, Spotsylvania, and uh, uh, North Anna River, and ends up uh, being part of a cavalry raid uh, that's known as the Wilson Cox Raid. Um, which uh, the idea was they were going to send this cavalry raid around which, uh, Richmond to hit the uh, Petersburg and uh, Weldon Railroad. Uh, they um, attacked in a place called Ream Station, and this took place uh, June 29th, 1864. And um, while they were there trying to tear up the railroad tracks, um, a Confederate cannon fired what's uh, known as a canister, which is basically like a... Um, and instead of firing a big solid ball, it's firing something essentially like a shotgun, uh, turning it into a big shotgun, so it's firing a bunch of musket balls. Uh, uh, Andrew Benson gets caught by one of these, he's wounded, and he's taken prisoner as well. And so um, all of them end up uh, going to various prisons around the South. Uh, some of them end up in Libby Prison in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, but they quickly move them farther south than that. Uh, some of them end up uh, down in uh, Macon, Georgia in prison. Uh, but eventually most of them end up in um, being imprisoned in a house um, between the Ashley and Cooper Rivers in Charleston. And that house actually belonged to uh, uh, George Rogers Clark Todd, who was a doctor in um, Charleston and is significant for us because that is uh, the First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln's brother. And so um, they were actually uh, held captive in his house. Um, from there... They moved from um, uh, Charleston and they put them in a prison camp in Columbia, South Carolina, which that prison camp is known as Camp Sorghum. And it was called Camp Sorghum because that's what they fed them, was sorghum, uh, which isn't great for the digestive system, so a lot of these guys ended up dying of dysentery. But um, uh, if you'll look at this picture of Camp Sorghum, you'll notice some things that you might expect to see in a prison camp that you don't. Fences, walls, they didn't have. 
What they have around the uh, camp to keep the, uh, the prisoners in is something called a deadline, which means if you go across that line, the guards will shoot and kill you. And so uh, there's no uh, need to try to tunnel out of this thing. Um, the um, uh, Benson and uh, Walpole and Carell actually tried to get up a big bunch of men uh, to uh, rise up and uh, overpower the guards, but the uh, ranking Union officer uh, there told them that uh, he wasn't going. <coughs> told him he wasn't going to allow that, and if they uh, persisted in it, he would turn them into the commandant. So instead of um, trying to take over the, uh, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, voice is uh, a little dry. So instead of trying to take over uh, uh, the camp, they decided to try to uh, do a mass escape. And so on the night of November 1st, uh, uh, 1864, 16 of the men simply get up and they make a dash across the lines. And um, as soon as they cross the deadline, the guards notice them uh, running out of the camp. They start shooting at them. Uh, first it's one or two guards, then it's all the guards firing at them. But uh, luckily for them, none of them were hit. Um, within uh, the next day, uh, the uh, guards from the camp are out scouring in the community. Of the 16 that escaped, um, uh, 12 of them were recaptured fairly quickly. Um, the only ones that were not recaptured were the men that we showed you at the beginning. Uh, Walpole, Benson, Carell, and Gear. Okay. Now it's where it gets fun. <clears throat> so these guys leave Columbia, South Carolina. They're trying to get back to the Union lines. Now, what would you think would be the Union line at that time, if you had to guess? Where would you go? North. North, right? right. North would be Virginia, right? What's going on in Virginia? That's where Lee's army and Grant are basically slugging it out. It is not... Uh, there's a tremendous amount of ground between Columbia and the Virginia line. So the one place they think of going is northwest into Tennessee. Now, why do they go to Tennessee? Anybody have an idea? State of Franklin. The state of Franklin, one thing, but Tennessee had already fallen to Union hands by that time to a great extent. Uh, there were pockets of resistance, but for the most part, Knoxville was under control of the Union forces. Nashville was under control. So they were trying to get to the Union forces in Tennessee, and they start up through Calpin, South Carolina, okay? And I'm going to pick up, and we're going to read to you some pieces from an article that was written by Andrew Benson, the first fellow that you saw up there. Okay, his, his article is called, My Capture, Prison Life, and Escape. And it was written in the 1880s, 1890s, somewhere around in there, uh, and was put together and was, it was in a book with a bunch of other stories from the Civil War. As I said, the thing has been there for years, and we found it about this time last year. Uh, but he goes into depth about his time in the prison camp and then his escape, and we're going to pick it up roughly about the time he comes up here. Okay, and I'll start, and then Jonathan's going to continue, and we got you a bombshell at the end of the story, right? Okay, we'll keep it at that. So here we go. <clears throat> We came to the French Broad River through that historical old place, the Cowpens. Everybody knows where the Cowpens Battlefield is, right? Okay. It is just across the line in South Carolina from Polk County. Is that right? Somewhere around in there? Polk County, Rutherford County, down through there. Okay, so they came up in here through Rutherford County, Rutherfordton, so forth and so on. One day we had an adventure with another man we met named Goforth. We'd been all day on the hill looking at him and his young men who were hauling corn fodder from the fields and piling it up in the barn. Oh, and I should throw in here, these guys are having to travel at night and then hide in the daytime. They can't just walk anywhere because they may run into some rebels that will turn them in, right? So they're hiding in the daytime. They're, they're following trails, but a lot of walking in the woods at night so that they don't get captured or get discovered. So anyways, they're watching these guys work in the daytime. Uh, we were between two roads. We did not dare to get up from the logs where we were for fear of being seen. And when it came night, just about dusk, we came down the hill, <clears throat> excuse me, leaving Walpole and Corral on the hill. We went to the house, climbed over a little fence, went alongside this man and said, Good evening. 
He seemed to be very courteous, and Colonel Gear said, or pardon me, Captain Gear said, can you tell me which road we would take to go to Morganton? Sound familiar? Okay, so either they're somewhere in Rutherford County. He says, this one over here, how far is it to Morganton? We said, eight miles. Are there any hotels between here and Morganton? One that they call a hotel three or four miles down the road. It's not very good, but they put people up. Then he said, who might you be? Gear said, we might be a great many people, but there are only two of us. We are special officers of the government. Okay? He wanted our papers, as that was the custom that any person out in a strange part of the country to have a pass. This is the Civil War, folks, okay? So you don't just go walking around like you do today. They had to have a reason to be out, and they had to have something to show why they were out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the custom about the past. Gear said, quote, We have papers, but we're not under any obligation to show them as we're special officers, as I've told you, of the government. I certainly decline, and I presume my friend will decline to let you see them. That This is uh, Benson and Gear. I declined, telling him that he couldn't see mine anyway. We kept him there until it was so dark that he couldn't see which way we were going. When we thought it was dark enough, we bid him good night, and we started along the road to Morganton. We wanted to go to Marion in an entirely opposite direction. We went over the hill, and as soon as he was fairly out of sight, we jumped in the woods and lay down. In a short time, those men saddled their mules, mounted, aroused their neighbors, and very soon six men came down the road as fast as they could in pursuit of us. After they had gone, we left our hiding place, went on around the hill, found our companions, and hastened out of the district as fast as we could. Okay? So there you go. They're on their road to Mary. Now we have found a couple of um, stories, I guess you could call, stating that they walked through Main Street and Marion at 1 o'clock in the morning. We can't substantiate that, but they came through Marion at night. We can say that probably happened. But now here's where the story gets interesting. We came a little further up the country to a place called Spruce Pine. We learned there was a man there named Isaac English who was recruiting for Kirk's Cavalry. That is uh, Lieutenant, what's Kirk's first name? George. George. George Kirk, okay, of the Kirk Holder War. We'll get to that a little bit later. He is a, a, a Union officer. He's in Tennessee, and basically he's making mayhem for the Union in the Confederate lines. And he does, uh, a little bit later, he does an attack into Morganton. Uh, he does some stuff, I think, in Limbo Falls. Uh, there's several attacks he makes over in this area, okay? And he uses soldiers actually from this region to do some of that. But anyways, to continue our story, uh, let's pick it back up. So he's recruiting for Kirk's Cavalry, and we were advised to go there as he would assist us. We found Isaac English and learned that it was true. He was a Union man, a loyal, true, staunch Union man. He told us that in the mountains above, now this is in the area around us right now, where it was very high up, there was a force of about a thousand Confederate deserters and half that number of refugees who had been obliged to leave their homes and seek safety in the mountains. Never heard of that before. Okay, so it was a no man's land. Uh, yeah, you don't hear big battles here, but this is going on, what we're reading to you now. They were cared for by people in the valleys below. So people down here were taking care of the folks up in the mountains and their Confederate deserters. They had there a loyal... Let me flip the page. A loyal league called the Red and White Stream. That's the title of our program tonight. And these people wanted us to go up and be initiated into the order. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the red and white string before I go into this, and then, then we'll continue. First off, let me get my paper out here. Uh, the initial name for the red strings, as they were called, and by the way, most everywhere you look for them, they're called the red strings. Uh, for some reason, uh, Benson puts red and white together, and he actually is going to talk here about them twisting a red and white string together here in a minute. So I guess Isaac included a white one for some reason. But the secret organization was known originally as the Heroes of America, 
and it originated among Union men with a view to their protection when the country would finally be overrun by federal armies. The foundation of the organization was based on the 18th and 21st verses of the second chapter of Joshua. And I was going to read those for you. It's out of the Bible. Okay, let me get this out here. Oops. Okay, there we go. These are the verses that they're talking about. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt find this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. So this is a, an Israelite battle. And they're using the red string, or it's mentioned here, to signify that, that there's support there. Okay, so that's where this comes from. Now the red strings themselves typically would hang a red string on a structure like this. And it would tell you that is a union house, so to speak. It's kind of like the Passover, you know, where they would mark on the door. That's what the red string was there for. But in this story, as you're going to hear, uh, Isaac's going to actually have them put a red string on their bodies. So I'm going to read you the rest of this. And then Jonathan's going to get into the uh, fiasco that ensues here a little bit later. So, like I mentioned, the red and white string, these people want us to go up and be initiated in the order. We told them we would go. We went up and found, as Mr. English had said, a thousand Confederate deserters and half as many refugees with their campfires burning, arms stacked, and having a good time. We were introduced to the leader, the master of ceremonies, and after the social part of it was over, we were told to kneel in a circle. They brought out a Bible and a wooden square and had us place our right hands on the square and with our left hand extended up to heaven, repeat after the leader a solemn oath which we did. We were given the countersign and the signal of distress and then decorated with the emblem of the order, which was a red and white twisted string to be tied in the buttonhole or elsewhere. So they actually wore it on their persons. Okay? He also told us that in Carter County, Tennessee, we would find a great many loyal friends. Now, Carter County in East Tennessee was a county distinctly loyal. Listen to this. It is surrounded by Yancey, Mitchell, Elizabeth, he calls it, I'm sure he means Elizabeth, Jackson, which Jonathan says down toward Knoxville somewhere, and Johnson counties. And nearly every person living in Carter County at the time we were there was as loyal as ourselves. The others were disloyal. Those who had been disloyal in Carter County were driven from their homes. They sought refuge in other neighboring counties, and all persons who had loyal sentiments were driven from their homes in the other counties into Carter County. The result was that Carter County alone was all loyal, while all around them were disloyal. That's Mitchell, that's Yancey, that's J uh, Johnson. All these counties were listed that way. Now, before we move on, let me get my little clicker back out. Ooh, has it went to sleep? There it came back. All right. Uh, I think my, I think I clicked the clicker. I get that back out here. There we go. So Isaac uh, kind of put these guys up for a few days. Okay, and that's what we want to show you next here. They had to cross the Blue Ridge, they came down to his house, and there's the red string, but his house was up just across the line in Avery County in an area that we call the Bend. It's near uh, Yellow Mountain up in there, up Gooch's Creek, Hanging Rock, back in there is where he had a farm, and he and Alice lived there. And he would take care of these guys, he put them in an area called the Yankee Rocks, and this is the Yankee Rocks. It's right along the side of the Tow River in the Bend, they would shelter themselves under this rock shelf, and Isaac would bring them food and provisions as he could, but at the same time, he was working in the Confederate iron mine at Cranberry. Now, a couple of things about him, and then I'm going to try to move this along a little bit. Isaac was injured as a child and was unable to fight because of a shoulder injury, so they assigned him to work in the iron mines in Cranberry. So he's trying to take care of these four guys and get them back to the Union lines, be it work the job and not get uh, suspected of doing anything else, okay? So we found two or three descriptions, you know, where they fed 
uh, he would feed them up under the rocks here. He'd take food to them. I'm not going to go into that too much, but the point is he kept them there until one night they made a daring dash into Johnson County, Tennessee. So we'd always heard that they got together up at Limble. Okay? That's not where they got together at. They actually go through Elk Park and over into Tennessee. Now, let me finish my reading and I'm going to give it back to Jonathan and we'll continue. A great many of the loyalists never stayed in their houses at night. They were on the alert, bushwhacking and raiding, and I learned with a little time there what it cost to be loyal. We had been in this county a day or two. We learned that Breckenridge had reinforced Vaughn and had driven General Gillum out of Bull's Gap in Tennessee, and all the passes by which we could get out had been stopped. Consequently, we were obliged to remain there until such time as circumstances would permit our getting away. At that time, they were forming a party to go to Johnson County on a raid, and we, not liking to be behind, decided we would join them, uh, go along for a little frolic, as he called it. There were 93 men, indifferently armed, but with little ammunition. A few had rifles, one had a flintlock, another had a musket, one or two had carbines, some had revolvers, some had 10 rounds of cartridges, others but three. We started on the raid, went across the mountain to what is known as the Elk River, and tried to make our way to Johnsonville, which I'm guessing is Mountain City, um, which is the Shire town of Johnson County. The scouts came in and reported such a force there that it would not be advisable to make an attack as we had not ammunition enough or strength enough to cope with them. Then we decided to go over to Roan Mountain and finish up the affair in that direction. I, being a cavalry officer, was in advance with five men. I rode over to this man and told him I wanted him to turn over to us all that he had in the way of oxen, horses, and other things that we were in need of. He wanted to know who we were and we told him we were officers of the Union Army. Well, that didn't seem to astonish him very much. However, we took everything he had in our line. So now we'll let John, uh, Jonathan pick it up and tell you about a couple of uh, military activities. Okay. <clears throat> so um, uh, we've actually, uh, each one of these guys did their own version of this story. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable that we've got, uh, can you hear it? Uh, so it's pretty remarkable that uh, each one of these guys left a version of this story. Uh, Benson's, who is the one that we've been reading to you tonight, is the most extensive one, but uh, Gear did uh, left a version, uh, and Walpole and Carell left uh, really small ones, but had some interesting details in it. Um, Benson's a little uh, uh, generous to some of the uh, deserters and whatnot that were around here by saying that the uh, people in the uh, valley were feeding them. It's true they did have uh, family that were uh, trying to support them, but when you've got at least 1,500 men that are probably running around in the bushes around here, uh, in order to keep from starving to death, you're not going to be able to depend upon that. And so a lot of what went on is they ended up uh, robbing people and uh, uh, trying to get food that way. Uh, it happened so much that um, a lot of the um, uh, folks over in uh, Yancey County started um, uh, abandoning their homes next to the roads and started moving up into the mountains to where it would be harder for them to get to to steal from. But uh, picking back up from the story, he says, uh, um, I, there, I there learned what a raid really meant. I had been on raids before, but I had never seen anything like this. Cutlery, bedding, household utensils, everything movable was taken out and tied in a bag. And in that way, taking oxen, sheep, cows, mules, and everything else, we had quite a miscellaneous stock. Uh, we moved on and for a long time did not see a man, but we captured everything uh, that we could find coming at last to a place called Taylor's Gut. It was a place through the mountains where the walls uh, rise abruptly three or four hundred feet. I was riding along at the head of the column uh, when an old lady came out and said, uh, Who is in command of this army? I said, Lieutenant Blackwell, who was in the rear. Well, she said, uh, you all are going to be murdered, every single one of you. And why do you think that? Because there is a powerful heap of men at, up at yonder knob. How many do you think are there? Oh, a right smart heap, a dozen of them at least. Well, I told her that if uh, there weren't more than a dozen, we shouldn't all get murdered. Uh, when the lieutenant came up, the old lady repeated uh, to him substantially what she had said to me. He called for volunteers to go into the bushes and shake them up, and in a minute they all wanted to go. There were not enough men left uh, to drive the flock along. The volunteers went into the woods and located these men very quickly. Then, after a little fusillade, we drove them into the gut. Uh, when we uh, came out, we reached a place called Taylor's Opening. 
We were riding along and we thought comparatively safe. I heard a screeching uh, behind, which really seemed as though there were 10,000 men in our rear. In the house of a Mr. Jake Wagner was a young lady who had just returned from boarding school. She was screaming to prevent the men from going into the house and at last persuaded them to go away. They left and then I stole a beautiful Arabian horse. I liked the horse so well that I thought that I would ride him off. I left word that I would send him back as soon as I had uh, no further use of him. Um, uh, Benson actually writes a, another article in 1885 uh, elaborating about uh, what went on at Wagner's. Uh, basically, the um, Union men went upstairs. Uh, 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 Wagner's daughter uh, was upstairs and terrified of these men coming in the house. Uh, they were, uh, and Benson got in between them, uh, ordered them out, and to leave her alone. And then um, she apparently uh, started crying on his shoulder whenever he came out. They asked him what he ended up with uh, or what he found in there. And he said that he found uh, three small diamonds, which were he, what he was referring to, the tears on his shoulder. Um, uh, she was actually pretty grateful about uh, his role in uh, preventing something worse from happening to her there. And uh, she uh, wrote him letters after the war. In the meantime, the small force that uh, we had left behind was coming after us. I turned around and saw a man coming over the hill uh, riding on a white horse. His hair was flying and his coat open to the shoulders, and six or eight more were coming after him. I saw our men running, some one way and some another, and concluded that there was going to be a stampede. But I saw in a moment that they were simply taking to cover. One got behind an apple tree, not over six inches in diameter. Another uh, behind a little stone pile. And another uh, took to the corner of a fence. Lieutenant Blackwell directed them not to fire until he gave the order. And as soon as the enemy were near enough, he ordered our men to fire. They did so, shooting four of them dead. The man who was riding the white horse, uh, when he fell from the horse, he did not engage his right foot from the stirrup and was dragged along the ground for some distance. We then charged them, capturing the uh, other four and took them along. That day we crossed the Elk River again, bivouacked for the night. The prisoners were put under guard and I suppose something uh, would be done with them. I didn't know what. Uh, but we had our campfires built and passed the night, which was very cold and as comfortably as we could. In the morning, as I was not sleeping very soundly, I thought I would go down and see about those prisoners. I walked down to where they had been, but they were not there. I went to Lieutenant Blackwell and said, Lieutenant, those prisoners have gone. And he said, oh yes. Do you know it? Oh yes, I suppose uh, they would go. Where have they gone? Well, uh, what has become of them? Oh, don't inquire. They won't trouble you anymore. Um, implication being he shot him. <laughs> um, uh, after we had eaten our breakfast, we started up uh, the mountain. There we uh, found a courier who had come from Carter County who said that Mitchell County people were there raiding. Sure enough, while we were away, nearly 200 men uh, from Mitchell County raided Carter County. Uh, when we returned there, it looked desolate enough. Uh, what we took back uh, with us from Johnson County was distributed to those people who had lost uh, by the Mitchell County people. Uh, by this time, the blockade was raised and we decided that we would move on. We started down the valley and came to a place called Bull, uh, Bull River Cove. We were there without food for some little time as we were getting out of the friendly district and amongst our enemies again. One day, looking into the wood, I saw a little red house and while watching it, a young lady came to the back door and shook the crumbs from a tablecloth. That made us feel so ravenously hungry that we decided, contrary to our custom, to go to the house and see if we could get something to eat. I went around to the back door and the young lady uh, came to the door and invited me in. When I got into the house, I didn't know what to say. I looked at her and she said to me, uh, uh, and I said, have you, said any, or have you seen any of our people go by this morning? She said, what people? I said, rebels, of course. She said, you are no rebel. If you had been uh, one, you would not have said rebels, but confederates. I saw that she had me, so I said, I am not a rebel, nor a confederate, but a Yankee. I came from Maine, way up north. I came from Portland. Why, she said, I've been in Portland, Maine myself. We had been to Canada and came through Portland, stopping in the United States Hotel. And she told me that her name was Lizzie, um, and she, he blanks out their last name, but it starts with an N. And that her father's name was William, uh, blanks out the last name, but starts with an N. And she said, uh, you mustn't go any further this way. Morgan's Raiders have come along this morning. They are desperate, set of men, and should see uh, that you will certainly kill you. 
Well, having gone so far, I did not wish to be killed just then, so I followed her advice. Uh, so called a colored ma uh, boy who took us on another road going in another direction, still having as the objective point of Knoxville. Uh, we had another great many of uh, minor adventures of one kind or another until finally we reached the Holston River. As we uh, approached Knoxville, we began to behave half decently again. Uh, previously, we had came to ferries with ropes. We had cut them after going across, or if there were boats, we had set them adrift, not asking permission of the ferryman to use the ferry. But this time, we thought we, as we were near Knoxville that we would be friendly and awaken the man and get him to set us across. I went to the house and knocked, and someone asked the question from within. In. Who are you and what do you want? I said that we wanted to be sent across the river and that we were officers of the Confederate Army traveling on special duty and that we wanted to get across the river. He said, I shall not uh, set you across until you tell me who you are. So I said, come down and I will tell you. So he came down with nothing but his shirt and trousers on and as soon as he opened the door, I took it. All I wanted uh, was the key, but unfortunately I had uh, had both the man and the key in my possession. I took him, or rather dragged him, uh, down to the boat uh, where the boat was moored and told him if he refused to set us across that possibly he would feel sorry for it or something to that effect. And he concluded that he would do so. He said, get into the boat and I will set you across or drown you. And he, I said, go ahead and we will take our chances. I really thought the old fellow tried to drown us, but he didn't quite succeed. At last, we got to the other side of the river, and he cursed us and left us there. Uh, we started for Knoxville. We went up on a high land so we could see the country around Knoxville, which was very broken. After going up one range of hills, we saw that what we supposed to were picket fires in front of us. We had been told that we should see them. So, uh, then we went down into the valley and up the next hill and saw the fires in front of us again, but nearer. The third time, going up the last hill, we had gotten well up to the height, but could not see any fires in front of us. Walpole said, where in the name of heaven are they? I can't see them. Uh, we happened to look around, and there we were inside our own lines, having come with, uh, within the lines without any challenge whatsoever from the pickets. And at last, we stood under the protect, uh, protection of our dear old flag. Uh, Walpole said, hello, and the men all sprang to their feet. It had been a cold night, and I didn't blame them for sitting around the fire. The challenge came, halt, who comes there? Walpole said, uh, friends without the countersign, advance one. Walpole went up, and as soon as he got within speaking distance, an officer said, are you aware that you are going out into the enemy's country? Walpole said, I am only aware that we are on our way to Knoxville and have just arrived from the enemy's country and come through your lines. Of course, the officer in charge was very much chagrined and said that he wished that we would not say anything. Um, to General Carter. Uh, and if we wouldn't say anything, then he would send us a guide into town four miles. He furnished us with horses and a man to take care of us. And we entered the town uh, and were taken to General Carter, adjutant general who gave us a pass to the hospital. We went there and tried to make ourselves as presentable as we could, considering the vermin on us. Then we then made requisition for and were given clean clothes and got into the bed for the first time in months and slept soundly. I never enjoyed rest more. As soon as this transportation could be obtained, we started for Washington. And after arrival there, Colonel Baker took me before President Lincoln and Mr. Stanton. Um, and I told them substantially what I am telling uh, you here. Of course, uh, there were some things that I remembered more vis vividly. Mr. Lincoln told me, after I had been there about 25 mi uh, minutes, I want to hear more about this, and I wish you would come tomorrow morning um, about this time uh, as you did this morning. I promised to do so. I spoke of the many deserters I'd seen in the mountains, and of course the Loyal League, and I told him of the extreme loyalty of those people down in Carter County, which pleased him very much. Okay. So, um, <coughs> you will talk about this? Um, sure. So the, um, so the picture we had up just before this was of uh, Abraham Lincoln and um, the Stanton he was talking about was uh, Edwin Stanton, who was the Secretary of War. So um, they actually uh, debriefed um, President Lincoln himself about uh, coming through uh, Mitchell County, and so uh, uh, all of this stuff, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln heard a version of it, which I think is really kind of cool. Um, it was just months before he was shot. It was been in January 1865. Um, yeah, they were, um, from November 1st, it took them 56 days, um, well, rather nights, they traveled at night, uh, to get from um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina to safety inside the lines in Knoxville, Tennessee. 
Um, that's averaging about 12 and a half miles a day, if my math is uh, right. Now, um, after the war, um, you had a, a lot of reunions going on. Uh, this is a reunion of the officers of the and some of the men of the 126 uh, New York Volunteer Infantry. And um, uh, here. It's right there. Um, Walpole's in this picture too, but I don't know which one he is. Um, so, um, but uh, I can tell you who some of the other ones are, but that's not a re uh, relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Um, Andrew Benson, who uh, he's the one that wrote the most extensive uh, account of this uh, coming through here. That's the one that we've been reading about tonight. Um, he uh, lives until um, uh, March 29th, 1905, and he's buried in the Evergreen Cemetery in Portland, Maine. Uh, Henry Carell, after uh, uh, he got back, uh, he went to um, Vermont and then eventually uh, Massachusetts, but uh, he ended up riding, uh, working in the uh, Brooks, uh, Brooks Edge Tool Company, which uh, makes um, axes. In fact, uh, uh, if you um, are into old tools, uh, the Brooks uh, in tools are really uh, uh, pretty well known for their quality. Well, um, unfortunately for uh, Carell, he had a bit of a hard time after the war. Uh, uh, he uh, served as an inspector in the bit uh, part of the uh, of that factory, and one day his coat got caught in the machinery, and it actually pulled him into the machinery and busted his ribs up. Um, so um, he had a bit of a rough time with that. Um, a few years after that happened, um, he had a real hard knock come up on his lip, uh, which um, at first didn't bother him too much, uh, so the doctor didn't do anything about it. After about two years with that, um, it started to hurt him more and more. And so um, um, uh, the doctor um, uh, cut into it and decided that it was uh, mouth cancer. And so he tried to, um, uh, tried to remove it, but it was a really painful operation. He went through uh, two of those, uh, but the operation wasn't successful. And so he actually died of cancer on September 2nd, 1889, and he's buried in the Evergreen Cemetery in Douglas, Massachusetts. Um, Horace Walpole, after the war, um, he lives in Syracuse for a pretty good uh, spell, and then uh, he ends up, um, after his wife dies, he moves to uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio, uh, where they have a National Soldier's Home. And that's the picture of the National Soldier's Home uh, there on the right that he was living in. Um, Walpole um, 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 is probably in this picture. Uh, this is uh, taken of all the uh, the men at the uh, at uh, lunch in 1902, and Walpole doesn't die until the next year in 1903. Um, so he died in uh, June 3rd, 1903, and he's buried in the Soldier Home Cemetery there, and that's his marker. And uh, we can tell you the exact grave he is if you're uh, interested in ever going up that way and uh, paying your respects to some of these folks. Uh, the final one is uh, James Gear, and I'm going to pass it over to Dave to talk to you about that. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Gear because he is on this property an awful lot in the 1870s and 80s. Okay? Um, one of the things I did mention a little earlier, there is some suggestion that he may have left a daguerreotype photo of himself with. Alice and Isaac when he was under their care. A little bit later after the war, letters from a gear start appearing here at the English Inn. And they are a little, uh, who is this? You know, what, what's going on? And he's doing his best not to, as he said, quote, cause Isaac any problems. He was a Union supporter. The South lost the war. The last thing that he wanted to do was, you know, give Isaac gr grief from the locals if there was any. But eventually, Alice realizes who he is. And she uh, writes back, and they begin a conversation. Gear comes down and visits with Isaac. Isaac shows him a collection of uh, minerals and gems that he's found in the area and talks about mining possibilities. One of the things we didn't mention, Gear himself ran a salt works in Syracuse, New York. And he was a fairly wealthy man. So uh, he and Isaac kind of hit on the idea of starting a company, probably one of, if not the first, mining companies in this area. And they built this in on the end over here that you see. And that was the first mica house in Mitchell County. 
Okay, they sheeted Micah in there for many years. Uh, in fact, we have a picture of one of Isaac's daughters in there by one of the windows sheeting Micah that was in the newspaper. Uh, this is Gear later in his life and his wife's picture to the next of him. And as uh, Jonathan mentioned, uh, he passes away in 1908 on uh, July 12th, and he is buried in a town called Camillus, New York, which is his hometown. In fact, he lived in his mother and father's house a good part of his life. But uh, he would go back and forth between Syracuse and Spruce Pine. He would come down here a lot. His daughters came down here with him from time to time. In fact, they served as teachers in the Presbyterian school that sat right over here in the woods behind us. Um, but, but he basically fronted the money to start mining in this area. Now, there were people doing wildcatting, but this is the first, I'll call it, organized mining that ever took place was right in this area, and the sheeting happened right over here on the English Inn property. Now, that brings us to Isaac and Alice. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about them, uh, Alice passes away actually quite early. She dies in 1885, and she was in her 40s. Uh, Chris, I'm trying to think. She had seven kids. Is that right? Uh, she had well, more than that. More than that. More than that. She had yeah. Seven daughters. Seven, seven daughters seven alone. Seven That's where I got that from. Seven, yeah. Seven but but anyhow, we don't know. She may have died in childbirth. But <laughs> yeah, she was only 44 years old when she passed away. Isaac lives another 25 years until 1910, and he passes away in August of that year. And they are both buried about, what you say, Sam, a mile from here? No, it's Roughly? It's literally on the other side of the hill over here. It's, it's a, probably a quarter of a mile. quarter of a mile. It's not very far from here, actually. Uh, and they are still in this area, buried. Uh, the tombs can be, you can get to the tombstones. The, the grave site is pretty rough right now, but if anybody is interested in it, we can tell you a little bit about where that's at. And one of the things I'll caution you is technically it's, I will say, on private land. Now, the, the cemetery itself is, is that, but you have to go through someone's driveway to get to it. So you don't want to just, you know, cruise up in there all the time. But he is buried, right literally. behind Mrs. Day's house, if you know where that's Yeah, at. if you know where Harold Van Day lived here in the English woods, it's right behind her house. Okay, and that's where the two of them are buried, here in, in this area. Of course, the town moves to the other side of the tracks, so to speak, when the railroad comes through. T.A. English, who was one of Isaac's sons, opened the first general mercantile in town around 1903. Uh, a little later, he has health problems. He leaves the area and moves to Transylvania County, Brevard area, and that's where he passes away around 1930. And in fact, a good bit of the Englishes marry into a Fowler family in Transylvania County, and there's a good group of them over there. They kind of vanish from this area, basically, to some extent. A few of them hang around here, but a lot of them leave. But uh, that's basically the story of Isaac and Alice. So. Anything else you want to wrap up with? No? Nope. Okay, well that's basically what happened though. So Isaac English helped at least four Union officers that we know of escape back to lines. There is some indication that he may have helped others. We just haven't found any records of that yet. But we do know about these four, and we again have established what we've told you tonight and showed you. We'll be happy to answer questions now from anybody that might have anything. Okay, that's a good question. She wanted to know how the English Inn came about. First off, let me tell you, we don't really know when it started. Okay? Uh, there was a cabin here. In fact, this area directly behind me on the lower floor is the initial piece of the inn. And you can walk up there and we can show you. It was built... We read some accounts in 1765, but most of us that work with the Historical Society agree there's no way it would have been that old. Uh, in fact, that was before the first settler in this area, Samuel Bright, lived here. So I don't see that. However, it could have easily been built in the 1700s later. There are uh, legends that the Overmountain men came by here at that time. Isaac came into possession of it in the 1850s. Uh, he actually purchased it from Alice's family. They were Rose. R-O-W-E is their last name. But he, he gets the... the in around that time. As I said, there's a chance those four guys came by here. But we know Isaac's house was up in Avery County. It was not here. 
but uh, it stayed in the English family. Mm, the Deneen family ended up with it, I guess, next, probably. And uh, it, it's went through a few owners since then. Brenda Sparks, who's here now, is the current owner of it. And she's here tonight. We want to really thank her for the hospitality of having us here tonight. Uh, and, and everything. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can't should talk about that. You want to know how the town got its name? Okay. This used to be the post office. In fact, we'll show you the mail slot up here where you dropped your mail. Uh, Alice English. This would have been prior to 1885. Isaac was appointed the postmaster in this area. At that time, it was called Rose's Creek, which was named for a creek up Alta Pass. But she, I guess they were filling out the application or whatever, and she looked out, and there was a pine tree across the way here. And she looked at it and decided Spruce Pine would be a nice name for the town. And that's how the town got its name. The tree was here. At uh, uh, least, I know, probably the 60s, early 70s. And when they built the bypass, uh, water somehow washed the roots out from underneath it and it died. So it literally was right across the road from us. And that's how the town got its name. Yeah. Where will you see that tree again? <laughs> In the Great Beyond. <laughs> <In> the Great <laughs> Beyond. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what, what are you coming at? It is in the town seal, I guess, now. Right. Yeah, it's what they, they're doing with it. Jim Jones took a picture of her with that tree, and the town of Spruce Pine adopted that as their logo. So on the town, uh, I guess town hall and fire department or police department, you'll see that, and also on the signs coming in, you'll see that tree, which was right over there. And the picture's in there. Yeah, the picture's in here you can see, and I guess I'll shell for my book and Chris's. Uh, the Spruce Pine book has a picture of the tree in it with one of the English daughters underneath it. Or, having her picture made in the 1940s. Okay, yes? <laughs> okay, anybody else? Yeah, David? Yeah. I, maybe I misunderstood, but didn't I hear one of the in the book in the an excerpt you were reading? Didn't somebody refer to spruce pine? Yes, uh, but this would have been before. Yes, explain. I would say that they called it that. Honestly, uh, Bruce, we found records of Chris. What? I didn't hear his question. He said I, that it was called spruce pine in this piece here. This piece was written after the post office. Yeah, it had been written in eighteen ninety. So, but. Uh, so we, we've seen named, records of it. She named the Spruce Pine, uh, she named the post office in 1859. Yeah. So yeah. that would have been before the Civil War. So. You know, David, uh -huh. when we were younger, we grew up in this area down here, and like when the names on the place and everything, it kind of, at one time, you know, it doors were open and everything. I remember we were younger or whatever and we when the boy scout meetings and stuff like that, we'd come up here and we'd start from one end. We'd go in one door. And so we pretty well I mean we'd go through every room and stuff like that. We didn't realize, you know, what the historical you know importance, you know, that it was. I know right over there that little house on the end bill. I don't know if it was a water house or whatever. Spring house. Spring house. Spring house. And we'd play or we left in these woods and everything like that. Before the bypass came through up here, they had a basin on the outside. There was a continuous, there was a water spout right there. And of course, now you, I never did figure that I'd see today, you know, because they bottle water and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> thirsty or whatever. And that was, I remember, that was the best water that you could ever, you know, think it was. Over here in these woods, and everything like that, I always remember, right over in that area right there, and I don't know if they had any, but there was, a, there was a big spruce tree, just like you were talking about. I guess it was spruce or whatever. But it seemed like it was different. It had a, and I don't know if it was the one, but it had a mound up to it. And my buddies now we always wondered if that was, a, you know, the, the mound around that spruce tree, if that was, you know, the spruce pine tree. And, uh, you know, before the bypass came, you know, you could go up in these woods right here, 
and uh, like I said, it wasn't any of those or anything. We had a uh, we had a sled run, probably Nancy and Roger. I'll remember it. Big scar on my leg. Start down here. <laughs> start down here and go up across the bypass up to Boone Street. If you know where that is, across the bypass up there. It was like a bobsled run, but and back in those days, I, well, that was back in the late '60s and everything. It would come like a, you know, we did when winter time came. It started about maybe mid-November of the latter part of November. And they'll back me up on this. We had 18 inch two, uh, two foot of snow. And I mean, we had snow. We had snow about every week. But those, all those spruces were up there were grouped together. And you talk about something beautiful. Every bit of that snow, you know, would settle, with the exception of where we rode sleighs and everything. And it looked like an enchanted forest to go back in there. No snow was on the ground. It was all, you know, up on top of those spruces. And uh, I wish everybody here would have had a chance, you know, to, to go up those trails. And there were places up there, you know, those ravines, you know, I was telling you about. When we were over there in the woods, you could, like two hills kind of going down. <clears throat> and there again, when we were playing up there, we got thirsty. We'd kind of run, run down through there and we'd say, hmm, walk this right here and there'd be a dipper hanging on a rhododendron bush or something. And we'd say, oh, our place gets some water. And we'd look right down there and we'd brush the leaves back and <clears throat> it'd be a metal top of the handle. We'd scoop that thing back and it'd be concrete there and you'd see all kinds of uh, salamanders. You knew it was plain water, but that's, that's just another thing. I'm sure you know that it was built at the same time. I mean, it had to be built by somebody. You know, that was... Chris, correct me. This is the largest log structure standing in the state, right? It's, it, it's not. It's, it's right near it. Yeah. And probably the oldest if we go by this, you know, Civil or Revolutionary War time that we're talking about. We don't know that. Now, pieces have been built on it over the years. As I said, the last piece was down here, and that was built in the 1880s, which we now know why it was built, because it's mentioned that they built it for gear in the mic. That's why that's on the end of it. Uh, the picture, and I tell you what, let me see if I can get back over to that right quick, because it's nice and light, uh, darker now, so let me get back up here, uh, this photo of it. Whoops. Go right there. There you go. Again, we're thinking it's 1870s. And where you see the pointed roof, that's right here. Where where this is sitting. And again, drop the point out the one you think is Isaac. If we were guessing. This one is Isaac, but we can't prove it. Yeah, we, there's no way we can prove it. Although Brenda tells me she might have us a photo sometime. So we'll <laughs> see. Know she knows she's got it. <laughs> and so. there's one in there. In that room, on the far wall, there's a picture of people sitting on the front porch right there, mm -hmm. and he's the one on the side. Okay, well, we'll have to get in there and look at that. Okay. All right, other questions about any, any of this? Okay, yeah. What about the uh, Underground Railroad remote? Is that? Well, the, um, <laughs> well, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> um, now, um, whenever uh, these uh, uh, escape POWs are coming up through here, they're actually probably getting shunted along an underground railroad for escape union prisoners. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, it's the same underground railroad that's uh, taking escape slaves. Uh, escape slaves kind of stick out up here, but uh, uh, so they didn't come through the. Uh, uh, that didn't come through here, but uh, you did have a lot of escape union prisoners coming through. Uh, some of the other accounts mentioned some of the other names of people that uh, uh, may have helped them along. Uh, one was a Greenlee uh, down in Marion, uh, and uh, supposedly they're supposed to have been uh, directed to uh, contact uh, Isaac English by McFalls. Um, but um, the Red Strings uh, did. Um, uh, serve as sort of an underground railroad for um, you escape union prisoners in particular. Okay, other questions? Well, I know, Brenda, you got the end open, right? Okay, so if you'd like to walk around and look here. So, I'm sorry, yes. You said that you found the information online. Yes. Where online? We um, search a little bit everywhere. Let's go with this, John. <laughs> um, 
this information comes from various places, like um, um, this account comes uh, has been digitized from Google Books. Um, a lot of their war, war records, we even have the records of them being in the uh, prison camps, comes from a website called Fold3. Um, uh, there's uh, some letters of them in that Fold3 site as well in some of their uh, files. Um, uh, we got um, some of the little details, like the details about um, um, about uh, Corel's son breaking through the ice came out of newspapers.com, um, as did the uh, account of him getting sucked into the machinery that also uh, ended up in the newspaper.com. Um, uh, um, there's a good website that the Vermont group is uh, putting together that's got some uh, good information on Corel in particular. and. Uh, um, uh, different libraries and uh, archives and stuff for some of the rest of it. I'll tell you, Dave, you can give a lot of credit to the field and this book. I remember, I mean, it wasn't mentioned, mm -hmm. but you know, when you mentioned, you know, uh, friends are having this yep. thing out here. And they got, the field got a hold of this, he'll tell you, I don't know how much time or how many man they have to get the and some others, but you know, restoration. Yep. I mean, the foundations and things were. It was just about ready to, you know, Bill Teddy too, he was about ready to, you know, fall in certain places and they had to, every time I came by here, they were working on down here. <laughs> Talk about the roof structure and, I mean, they took, they took a lot of work. It's, 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 it's beautiful. A lot of nights I've been working at home. They may have seen some things. And now, now there are rumors of ghosts in here. We might add. Tell you a ghost story if you got time. We might have one. Let me say one quick thing. We do have one of our internet friends here with us tonight. Tom Duckworth. The dude. But it, yeah, is back here. He runs the Vermont and the Civil War website, where we got the information about Henry Correll. Now, this is really wild, folks. I went on Facebook and wrote and asked that, you know, we were researching this and asked if we had any information. So he contacted me through Facebook. We discovered he lived in Candler, North Carolina. And he'd been down here, what, a year? Year and a half. Year and a half. And I told him about it and he came tonight. But the internet brought us together. And we thank him because he gave us the pictures of Henry's tombstones. I think came off of there, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he also helped us get his picture that you saw up here tonight. So uh, it, it was just really a treat to get to meet him and have him come, you know, come and be here with us tonight. Dave, just one more thing on the information you gave us. Rhonda that the dad had up there. It, you know, you said that dear fellow mm -hmm. that wrote up all that correspondence. They said when they were here, some of them said that he, uh, that Isaac's wife, he wrote down on the back of a paper bag or something, his address or whatever, and <clears throat> several of those letters, it's, it's in that information there, Rob is going to uh, get out there. So he's written several letters, and, you know, like you said, they wanted to make sure, for the gentleman wanted to make sure, you know, that they finally, she looked, she found that, and she looked on the back side, and she had written that gentleman's name down. Now that's, that's in one of those, uh, and that information right there. And of course, when she did find that, she showed it to Isaac, you know, uh, they tied, you know, together. But it's like you said, they, it took quite a, quite a while, you know, before they were comfortable, and then she found that, you know. All right, Brady, you want to come tell your story? Yes, somebody uh, else? If, if you can go back to those two pictures of uh, uh, James Gear. Uh, yeah, okay. Give me just a minute here, I'll get back to you. The two that have him, and I guess it's his wife. His wife, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll get there in a second. I don't know if uh, some of you folks that grew up here probably remember uh, Ruth Deaton, uh, who taught here. Now, she was gone by the time I came to school, but uh, she, I think, was in a wheelchair. And anybody remember Ruth Deaton? Uh, she, uh, her son was a doctor in Virginia, and I actually got a hold of her. She, she had a lot of the older pictures of Spruce Pond. Uh, and I 
went on a quest to find those orig original pictures uh, and found her son, who was a doctor in Virginia. Uh, he's actually still alive and lives in Asheville now. He's about 100 years old, but his daughter is actually a teacher in Asheville. Uh, those were original family pictures that Ruby Deaton had. Ruby was Isaac's granddaughter. Uh, she was Ruby Wiseman, but she was one of the granddaughters. Uh, those were original pictures from the Gear family, so uh, they were really the the friendship between the Gears and the Englishes was was big. The Englishes went to Syracuse a lot. The Gears came here, uh, and it's interesting. Not a lot of the Englishes stayed here. Uh, they all, except for one or two, they all moved to other parts of North Carolina and Ohio and other parts. But those were original pictures that I actually scanned that they had given uh, the English family that she still had. Now the other thing to think about this, when he came here, there was no railroad. So he had to go, I guess Marion had been close yeah. to stop, Marion or Johnson City, and then ride in here. Because there was no railroad in Spruce Pine until 1903-1904 in that area. So he never rode the railroad here, I don't think. Kind of an interesting thing to think about. Right, anything else? All right. Brenda, Brenda, story. Brenda, come tell us your ghost story. <laughs> That'll give you something to, to look for while you're up in the end. <laughs> there you go. Well, I, first, I want, I want to thank you all. That's This has been a wonderful, wonderful program. I, really enjoyed it but since bill and i've had this place i bet i've been asked hundreds of times is it haunted so i'm going to tell you one story uh i'm going to tell you a story that um two things i'm going to tell you two stories if you've got time i'm going to tell you first uh this was written down in a letter i have by one of isaac english's granddaughters and she told it like I can't remember if it was a grandson or a granddaughter, but he told it like it happened here. Could have been later in the war or something, and uh, I may be wrong. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, it was. It may have been after the war, but anyway, a group of raiders came by here, and after the war, it was lawless around here. And uh, the the people that David was talking about a minute ago, they were the outliers, and people would hide out in these mountains, the north and the south, and they would come down and raid and steal from all the local people just like he was telling and so uh, at the end of the war close to the end of the war isaac was up working at the confederate ironworks and uh, they had they had bought this place is the way the grandchild described it and uh isaac was gone he would the way I, uh, the way it was told in the letter that i have he would leave and work all week and then come back on the weekends so he was gone, and a, this group of raiders came by, and I, I, I believe they were Union uh, from the North, and Union soldiers, and they, would, they came by. And Mrs. English was here with her children by herself. And, uh, they, and at that time, over across the creek over there, there was all kinds of outbuildings, barns, sheds. There was a store at one time here in this area, and uh, all kinds of, it's like a little community right in here. And so, uh, the, 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 they saw the riders come into the yard, and uh, Ms. English said, Oh, children, children, come, uh, let's go in my bedroom. And her, their room at that time was that room, wait a minute, that room. No, it was that room. I think it was that one. Sorry. <laughs> I have to get, count my rooms here. And if you'll notice, this place is so old, none of the rooms open at, into each other. They all open out on the porch, on the porches. That's how old it is. That's the way the really old homes were built. But anyway, she said, children, children, let's go in my bedroom. And no decent gentleman, and, and I'll say that I'm sick, no decent gentleman would come into a woman's bedroom. And so all the children went into the bedroom and got under the bed, and she got in the bed. And... Uh, the, the Union soldiers, I'm going to say Union, <laughs> I'm going to say they were Union, and uh, they, they came and uh, <clears throat> got all the chickens, and uh, when, the, when they came, the family was just getting ready to sit down and eat supper, and that was in that first room there, and they had their, the only thing they had to eat was cornbread 
and milk. And they had just milked the cow and were getting ready to eat supper. So uh, the soldiers came and the the women and the children just had to run into the bedroom there. And they looked out the window and the soldiers were getting their chickens and their pigs and everything else and they brought the cow out into the front yard and killed her and um, were going to cook her and eat her. And one of the little girls, and I don't know which one it is, but I think I had it. One of the little girls saw them do that and <clears throat> um, she ran out and one of the men, one of the soldiers was in the dining room and he was eating their cornbread and had picked up a pitcher of the milk and was just drinking it up like that. And the water was, and the milk was just running down through his beard. You know, back then all the men had beards and it was just a, a repulsive sight to her and she was just a little child and she jumped on his back because he had killed her cow. And you know, back then, <laughs> when you went to milk your cow, I mean, it was sort of like a family member, you know, it was where you was getting your milk and your food and everything. And so she jumped on his back and he knocked her off. And when he knocked her off, she hit her head on the hearth and knocked her out and made a great big cut on her head. And she was knocked out and laying there. Well, the sergeant came in and saw what was going on. Oh, wait a minute, first I left out something. Well, he thought he'd kill the child and he uh, raked out coals out of the fireplace and raked them out in the floor. He was going to burn down the house to, to uh, hide what he had done and everything. Well, the sergeant rushed in and saw what was going on and he kicked the flames and, and the coals back into the fireplace and, and rounded up his men and left. And when they left, they stole, Is stole Isaac English's mule or horse or whatever he had here. Well, they got the little girl up later on the table. She came to, and that was the grandmother, and she told her grandchild this story. And she said then she had that scar on her head for the rest of her life. And the grand person, whoever it was, boy or girl, said that his mother never could stand to watch anybody <clears throat> uh, with a mustache or a beard drink milk because she always thought of that, what had happened to her when she was a little girl. And that's a, that's a true story. Um, well, I'll tell you something else. Um, I've always been asked again whether the old English inn is haunted, and we've had several experiences. I don't know if you'd <clears throat> call them ghost experiences or not, but I, I did have a paranormal uh, group come here. <coughs> and has anybody ever seen Ghost Hunt on television? It was just like that. <laughs> Really, I bet they had $50,000 worth of equipment, and they came twice. And I'll tell you about both times. So the first time, uh, they only did it. They did it first. This place is pretty big, you know. So they did this half the first time, and that half the second time. Well, they didn't do the mica house. They just did that part. But the first time, you know, you feel sort of silly. You're walking around in the dark. And uh, they had a, a command center set up in this room right here. And uh, with all their computers and all this stuff, they had cameras on every inch of that place. And, and these uh, monitors, if you walked in front of them or something walked in front of them, the lights would go, you know, the uh, alarms would, they'd see it on their computer and you're walking around with this little thing saying, are you here? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> Will you give me a sign? <laughs> that kind of thing. And you sort of feel silly doing that, you know. But uh, we were over here, turned out all the lights. There was about 10 people. It took them all day to set that stuff up. But we were in the dining room there, and I was holding this little monitor, and this guy was going around with me. And uh, he said, now, you know, ask a question or ask questions. So I said, well, are you here? Can you give us a sign? Stuff like that. And about that time, the back door in the kitchen slammed shut. And I don't mean it just shut. I mean it slammed shut. And it scared me to death. <laughs> and <laughs> and he's, we've got all that on video and on audio and everything. And uh, so he would, he would knock on, on a table, table like this. And then he... You would expect something else to go. Well, it did, but it only did once. 
it just did one thing like that. And I heard that. So <clears throat> the minute they did this, after we were through, we would go back to where his computers were sitting and he had all the recordings and he would just rewind it and all this stuff and we would listen. And so when that door shut, uh, we could listen in the kitchen. It was in the kitchen and you could hear footsteps like a woman. You know how they used to wear those high heel, the, 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 they laced up shoes, but they were sort of hard soled like an, a lady would wear back in the 1800s, you know, it'd come up to about her ankles. Well, it was sort of a hard shoe, and it would go, and it just tap, 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 slam. And you could hear it. And there was nobody in there. Because there is a, 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 a revolving door. What do you call it? A door there. A swinging, a swinging door. <clears throat> so it was, I mean, I, I was in there. I know there was nobody there. <clears throat> so the next time they came, they did this part over here. And they set up in the Micah house over there. And they had all their computers and everything. And again, they turned off all the lights and it was very dark. And I have to give you a little family history here. But I had a great, great, great grandfather, John Renta Baker, that was in the Battle of Kings Mountain. He was in the Revolutionary War. And... I didn't know that the first time we did this. But in the National Geographic, it says that the Over Mountain men marched by English's, or by the cabin. It wasn't Isaac English's at that time. By the cabin here. And, uh, and of course, back then, this was not the United States. This was Indian territory. And they weren't supposed to be here. The white people weren't supposed to be here. But, of course, we all know that white people never... Um, honored their treaties. They always went into the Indian lands. And I assume that's what happened here. Uh, I don't know that for a positive, but I, I know that it was here then. And uh, so, of course, there was only, at that time, this part and another log part that burned down later over there. So, I was in this room and that one right there, the oldest part. So, I said, um, my grandfather, I was talking to nothing, you know, you're talking to nothing and holding this little thing. And I said, um, my grandfather was supposed to have marched through here going to the Battle of King's Mountain. And I, at that time, I thought, well, he wouldn't have known where he was going at that time, you know. I mean, that's we're looking at hindsight. I know he was going to the Battle of King's Mountain, but he wouldn't have known that. But I said, at that time, can you tell me, was this an inn? Or was it a tavern? Because that's what I have read and heard that it was at that time a tavern. Now, I don't think it was a tavern like uh, with a lot of like um, a very busy tavern like a pub or something like that. But it was a place for refreshment or maybe for people to stop and stay. But I didn't hear a thing at that point. So we went back to the control room and... He, he replayed that and this was about 10 minutes later and there was something right after I asked that question and he played it again and it said tavern did you hear that it said tavern and it says it plain and you can hear it right now <laughs> huh? it was just a whisper was it Bill? Bill. Yeah. It wasn't Bill. Huh? It wasn't Bill. <laughs> Bill wouldn't stay up that late. <laughs> no, there was nobody in there but me and this one man, you know, or two men, I'll say that. <laughs> but so there's, and there's other stories, but I'll save that for another time. Okay. And thank you for coming and thank the Historical Society. <laughs> Uh, we worked as uh, he said we worked over here a whole lot on this place and uh, Grant and I, Grant's my older son we would have been over here late one night and he come by and was standing around was watching and there's a window over there that, that, that hinges out it ain't a double hung, it ain't a single hung it ain't a roll out it just hinges out with a hint, hinge and uh, it's rusty real stiff and don't open very well 
it was as still a night as it is right now. We were sitting there on the corner of the, that deck we built on, and I looked up there, and me and Grant sitting there was kind of tired. That wind went. <laughs> and I said, so in a few minutes it went. And shut back. I looked over at Grant, and I said, son, did you see that? He said, daddy, I saw that. And it done it again. And I went up there, and that's the, that's the quarters where the servants slept. It's kind of bunks in there when you open up there, you can see it. It's kind of bunk-like places. And I went up there and opened that window myself physically, and you had to really push it to get it open. And we've had incidents here where the, where the pillows on them couches in there were all slung out on the floor. We'd go put them back, and a few minutes later, they would be off from the floor. And that's the truth. <laughs> I'll tell a lot of stuff that ain't true, but that's true. <laughs> but anyway, then we had electri electrical situation here where we'd turn the lights on, the breakers would throw, and some of the guys over here were doing some of the electrical had the same experience. But let me tell you the main thing. I was sitting right up there, behind that little white car of dollies. I guess that's dollies, ain't it? Sitting up there one day. It's been several years ago. Work I'm going to condense this real fast. Uh, working on the appraisal, getting out of the office a few minutes, and there was a guy come by and asked me if I knew anything about the inn. I said, well, yeah, a little bit. I said, we bought it a while back, and he said, I want to tell you what happened here if you'll allow me to. His name was Manning, and he was with his mother. He was a chancellor of a college, and he had his son with him. He was probably 65 to 70, 72. He said, I want to tell you what happened here to me. He said, I don't care where you believe me or not, this is what happened. He's sitting in room, what we call room A, which is right above the, uh, right, right up there, above the uh, dining area. He said, me and three other guys are here on sabbatical. And he said, one guy with me, his name was Billy. I don't remember his last name. You probably never told me. I have a letter of this account at home in, the, in, the, in my drawer over in the bedroom in there where he sent me a, a written account of that. I, David, I should share that with you. Uh, an account of what happened but they were up there in that room a reading one afternoon and there was a table sitting over in the corner Brenda you may correct me if I'm telling this wrong but the the, yeah in the dining room I mean they stayed up there but anyhow there's a table over there with a lamp on it daytime and he said Billy was a big kid pulled jokes tricks up on them, all of them but he said he was there and the rest of them were reading, and he looked over, and that lamp turned over on the table, like that. Then a complete 360 revolution, and set back up. The lamp. And he's sitting, I'm, this is serious, this guy, he's either, a, he literally looked to be credible to me. I don't think he's a liar. But he said, I said, it had to be Billy. Billy has pulled this somehow with a string, lever, something. Said we went over and inspected it, and, and none of the rest of them seen it but him. He went over and inspected it, and there was no strings, no nothing. I'm talking about a lamp. A lamp, maybe, according to the way he told me, is about this high from my thumb up. And he sat there and waited a few minutes, and they all, he told them what he'd seen, the other three. Billy said, I swear it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. So they sat there and just still and quiet. And in a few minutes, they all three observed the same thing again. The lamp laid down, done a revolution, and it set back up. Now, that's what he told me. And you would be more likely to believe it if you met him and his mother and his son. They were, they were credible people, in my opinion. And we've had other things happen here, but I'll let it go with that. Here you go, David. <laughs> Go ahead, Let's find on ghost stories. That's cool. All right, so the inn is open. If you want to take a look around, Jonathan and I will be around for a little bit. We'll be happy to answer questions, show you some of our research. Uh, and again, we thank you for coming out. We've been excited to share this because, again, it's been there all these years, but we didn't know about it until recently. So hopefully you learned something tonight about your county and more importantly about Isaac English and, and what happened here during the Civil War. Thanks again for coming tonight. So thanks to David, thanks to Jonathan and Mara, and thank you, Brenda and Bill. We really, we really appreciate it.